The last factor we're going to talk about this week in choosing where your garden goes is one that matters because when you choose the wrong place, your whole garden could just get wiped out or trampled in an instant. I'll explain what I mean in just a minute. I'm Amy Landers with Gardens That Matter, where we help families create beautiful, bountiful gardens together. And if this is the first video you're catching this week, we have been talking about how to decide where to put your garden, <clears throat> or maybe if you're expanding, how do you decide where to put new growing areas? And so we've been thinking about our vegetable gardens and we've been I, looking for the ideal place for those vegetable gardens. A lot of our vegetables are annual plants that we have, as humans, we <laughs> have babied over the years so that they really love ideal conditions. And we can give that to them in these small areas in our gardens. And so, you, so far this week, we have talked about finding a convenient location that you're gonna pass by often. We've talked about sunshine and how you need a place that really has probably around eight hours of sun for most vegetables um, that we eat the, the fruits of. So tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers, those kinds of things need eight hours or more of sun. There's other things you can grow in shadier spots. So if you have a shady spot, go back and watch our sunshine video for a few ideas. Then we talked about soil and water, how you're gonna get water to your plants, what kind of soil you have in that area and whether you need to amend it or use another solution like raised beds or containers if your soil isn't great. Today we are talking about a group of things that can wipe out your garden in an instant. So the overarching idea today is movement. How things, elements, factors move through your garden. And so this is gonna be a little different for each of you. And I'm gonna give, give you four examples of how factors in our environment, um, other organisms <laughs> might <clears throat> affect your garden with movement. So when you're choosing your site, you've found maybe a couple of potential sites and now you really just need to narrow it down. So this exercise can be a good way for you to really think about how to narrow down a few top choices or you can use this exercise to identify potential problems and prepare to block movement if needed. All right, so let's get into examples so this will all make sense. So the first one, is water. So we're gonna revisit water. We talked about how to get water to your garden yesterday. Today, I want you to think about how water moves through your yard. When it rains really hard, where does the water move? What gets washed away? Is there a slope in your yard? Um, is there a place where water pools? These things impact where your garden is. So you, ideally, you want your garden on a pretty flat slope to prevent, you know, if you put your garden on the side of a hill, there's a good chance that because you're turning the soil in that area, unless you do no-till gardening, which is something we can talk about for sure another time, but that soil is vulnerable to erosion. So if your garden is on a flat area, you're going to have less erosion from the water moving across your yard than if you had planted on a slope and the water was moving down that slope. You can also think about capturing water in the soil. If you do have a slope, maybe you're gonna create kind of a terrace, and maybe you wanna create a berm and a swale and plant on the berm so that that swale, the, the, the low area, captures the water and holds it, and then the berm is up on the top. And I see that um, my mom, Nana, is joined and somebody else must be. <laughs> hi, Emerson, hi, Ollie, hi, Parker. The boys are next door, thanks, Nana, and they'll be here soon and so we're actually going to have uh, the boys are going to be on spring break so next week we're going to have some boys helping with the videos which will be fun so you'll want to tune in they probably are going to be pre-recorded just for timing nap time and everything uh, but yeah tune in next week for some kid projects so let's get back to movement sorry <laughs> I digress um, but the movement of things across your yard water that one that's one that you can picture right um, I encourage you to go outside in the rain, in a rainstorm, because you'll notice movement, movement that you might not otherwise see. So I went out in a rainstorm last year and saw that a lot of water was like 
going down this one area in the corner of our pasture and like off our property onto the neighbors and then down to the creek eventually, which is okay, but I would rather that water stay here first and percolate into the soil and be stored underground in our soil so that we have better um, drought resistance over time. And it'll eventually make it through the groundwater down to the creek. So water moves through your yard and you wanna make sure that you're not planting in a place that you're gonna get washed away or that becomes boggy after a lot of rain, right? If you plant in a low spot, uh, maybe if the soil's not draining well, that might get boggy. All right, so another example of considering movement through your yard is to think about the wind. So how does the wind move through your yard? And so if you have done our seven day challenge, you maybe have worked on this and, and thought about where does the winter wind come from? Where does the summer wind come from? Um, what is happening on either side? Like what is coming from the neighbor's house next door? So for example, um, in our seven day plan, we do like a, a really detailed site plan and there's a link to that in the description. If you want to join us, you're welcome to join us to do the next one, which will start next week. But actually, there'll be one. You, if you sign up to on Friday, you probably will get to do this week's. But in any case, wind moving through, you may want to think about putting up some wind breaks so that a cold winter wind, you're blocking that so that your garden is more protected. Um, if you have a cool kind of summer breezes that come through, that might be something that's welcome in your garden. You may want to situate your garden to welcome those in so when you're out there working, you get a nice cool breeze. Um, let's say you have a neighbor who maybe sprays their yard heavily or, I don't know, just uh, has a, trees that have a lot of pollen. Um, and maybe you want to think about the wind comes through their yard and that's bringing things from their space into yours. And do you want to try to mitigate that or adjust where you put your garden accordingly? Um, a lot of times some of the pest insects will travel on the wind, you know, like the flying insects are going to be probably more likely to come from that. Um, they can't, they don't have to travel on the wind, but they can. And so you might think about, you know, if you have a big empty weedy field um, and seeds, insects and seeds. Let's say you have a big weedy field on one side of your property and the wind comes across that field before it gets to your yard. Guess what's coming with the wind? All those weed seeds, whatever kinds of insects, pest insects are in there, maybe also whatever kind of predator insects are in there, right? So you're going to have some migration into your yard from that wild space which could be good or it could be bad. You know, like if you have a bunch of weed seeds blowing into your yard, into your garden where they're like, it's disturbed soil and they're like, woohoo, let's go. That's maybe something you want to consider. So you might adjust or put up wind, you know, figure out some windbreak ideas accordingly. All right, so water moves through your yard, wind moves through your yard. How about children and pets? <laughs> children and pets move through your yard, boys. You guys have your certain tracks you like to run on, right? You have the path to Nana's house, you have the path to the chickens, you've got the path to the garden. Um, and dogs have that too, right? They have their, their kind of patrol paths that they, that they circle um, and check everything out. And you'll see, like you'll see that the grass is trampled down there, you get a path. What happens if you try to plant or put your garden in the middle of those paths? Well your garden will probably get trampled. So you either want to avoid that path or you want to plan for it and maybe have a small fence or put up some rocks to like show like this is the border um, and encourage pets and children to go around. All right, so the paths of the, <laughs> are, are things that live with us matter. And so you could also think about maybe there are, there's wildlife that comes through and the path that the wildlife takes through your neighborhood. So, you know, we have coyotes that come through and they actually are mostly down in the bottoms. So we don't see a lot of evidence of them in, in our yard. But if we lived in a place where they were coming through, we might think about that. They'd be great, you know, rabbit control. Uh, but we probably wouldn't want to put our baby chickens near them. <laughs> um, you could think about that with deer as well, because deer tend to have paths that they travel. So you can think about where is the deer pressure the highest and, and Put your garden, place your garden accordingly, or put up barriers as needed. 
All right, the fourth thing that we're going to talk about moving through your yard is equipment. Because sometimes with our gardens, we need to bring things in that maybe it's a a lawnmower or a tractor or a tiller if you're doing if you're tilling your garden maybe it's a load of compost or a load of mulch or a load of leaves so think about how things come in and out of your yard so a lot of times if you have a gated yard you just have one place where things are coming in and out right and so it matters whether you're going to put you know you 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 it matters whether you're going to put your garden in a spot where normally like oops that's where we would drive through if we needed to drive a vehicle into the yard to deliver some wood to build a shed or something like that. So think about those access points. Where's your gate? How does the equipment get in there? If you need to deliver some compost to your garden, um, if you're going to be using wagons and wheelbarrows in your garden, like if you're doing something bigger and you're going to have tractors or um, like a tractor with a cart, like if you're going to be harvesting a lot of things, Think about that in your placement of your garden and either build in some permanent paths, right? So you can do that with your with your pets and your kids too, but like you can build in some paths that are like just designated spaces for the equipment and the people and the and the pets to, to be. Um, or you may want to design a different a different path. You may want to shift um, and put up some barriers so that you're you're not unintentionally having people go across that space with the with the lawnmower or the tractor. Um, so we have a space that we created a mini meadow. Um, and so grandpa is an excellent mower, but the mini meadow, we didn't want to get mowed. And so we put up a berm to make it easy for him to mow on one side and then the other side gets a little wild and wooly, which is my style. Um, but it's just a contained wild and wooly <laughs> area. So hopefully it works okay for him. So far it has. So yeah, so think about how equipment people, pets, water, wind, move through your yard. Are there other factors? Do you have fire danger where you live? Does fire, do you need to think about how fire might move across your yard? And can your garden be part of a space that's a fire break for your house? So think about those things, incorporate them in. If you wanna do more with your site planning, I really encourage you to sign up for that seven day garden planning workshop because we, that during that challenge, we have a site planning day where we have a big old list of things that you can look at and discover about your own site that will just give you fresh insights. So if you're just trying to figure out that best place for your garden though, and you just kind of want to get started, you're not quite ready for the challenge, I do have a workbook that I've put together for you and it is over on our website. It goes live on Saturday. If you're watching this Friday, it'll be live on Saturday, but you can sign up for it anytime now. Um, when you go to the website, you'll get to sign up and you'll get a post, you'll get the, notified when the post goes live and when the workbook is live. Um, and so you can head on over. There's a link for that in the description as well. If you have questions about where to locate your garden or a challenge with something moving across your land that you would want help brainstorming about or just have, have extra ideas about, get some help with, I would love for you to leave a comment. Even if you're watching the replay of this, I do come back and check these for comments and I would love to hear from you. So next week we are, uh, we will be back with kids activities in the garden. We're going to do some projects and we're going to share them with you. I'm excited about that. If you have also ideas for future episodes, things you want to learn about, I would love to hear from you by email or in the comments about that as well. I want to thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a happy Easter and a wonderful weekend. Happy gardening!